Turn to the book of John, chapter 8, if you would, please. John, chapter 8. Um, I will go ahead. I think I said it the other day, but we have tentatively um, made an agreement with uh, Southwest Radio. Uh, They have some new management guys. I really like some of the things they're doing. Um, And they really like some of the things, some of the stuff that we put out. And um, they, uh, they set up about six conferences in different places around the country this year. And they want me to speak at all six of them, and uh, which was, that's quite an honor. That's, and that's going to keep, that's a busy schedule. Um, so it's usually a Friday and a Saturday, and it's not any place that we can't get back to late Saturday night. We can't get back home late Saturday night, be here Sunday. So anyway, because um, that's kind of a criteria with me. If, if you're going to ask me to do something on all these Sundays, I can't do that. So anyway, um, and then uh, they're working on um, our church hosting something for them. And uh, of course, I've got to find out and make sure that all the speakers are going to use the same Bibles I'm going to use. Not going to have chaos in the house of God. Amen. There's just no, no reason for it. Uh, it'll, just, it'll just bring confusion. Amen. Don't want to do that. So, and I don't want to get into some big fight in front of everybody. I just don't want to do that. So anyway, I, you know, let's, let's just pray about it and we'll just continue to ask the Lord about it. Make sure it's okay. John chapter 8. If you're there, say Amen. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees don't like him. Why? Because he speaks the language of the people. And you notice, anybody, it doesn't matter if they are liberal or conservative. Why is Donald Trump so popular amongst most of America? He's a billionaire. He never sweat a day in his life. He speaks the language of the people. He knows what we want as Americans, and he speaks to that. In, he speaks to that part in us, and that has made him loved by a majority of the voters of this country, and despised by the power elite in this country. Same thing, and it doesn't matter if you are liberal or conservative. If you can speak the language of the people, they'll follow you. Jesus is sitting among the people. He's talking their language. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees who have the religious robes that can never get dirty, cannot be defiled by the common people, They just look religious up there and everybody down there is afraid of those people up there because just with a look and a point somebody could could be crucified by the end of the night. You never know. They're afraid of the power that those people have. And the scribes, so verse 3 again, the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and when they had set her in the midst. Now this was a set up. This, I, I have no doubt, you can have an opinion about this that differs from mine if you want. That's perfectly fine. The Bible doesn't say it's a setup. I'm saying I think it was a setup. I think 
that they had arranged for somebody. They knew who the prostitute was. They knew who the guy was. And I think they had set this thing up. Here's Jesus teaching in the temple. And they're going to drag her out saying we caught her in the very act. And it, it's a, I mean, it's a ridiculous idea, I plan that they have, because nobody here in this story says anything about the guy that was, that was part of this. What did he do? Run, run off? Did he still have his sandals on and he just run off? What? What, what was going on? Nobody says a word about the guy. They bring this guy out here. This was set up. That's my personal opinion. You can, take, you can believe whatever you want to. And it won't, won't hurt anything. Because God didn't say it. So it's not really that important. But anyway. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst... They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And they said, verse 5, Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? They were trying to get him to go against the law of Moses. Now, remember this thing I told you a while back about the number of angels that there are and how it's an unlimited, innumerable amount of angels and that there's no way that we can count the number of angels that there are because they're in, they are in... in they go into infinity. And yet God knows what a third of infinity is. Okay? P uh, pick, figure that out, Einstein. Figure out what a third of, of infinity is. Okay? And so God is so smart... Now, there's, and who's sitting here? God is. Who created all the angels? The guy sitting here. Jesus, the creator. He created all the angels. He knows how many there are. Down to the very last one, and he's the most high above them all. He knows how many there are. He knows how, how, how to cut off a third of them. And cast them down to the earth. So he's that smart. You are never going to win this. You're never going to win an argument with Jesus Christ. You're never, ever, ever going to be smarter than God. Never are. So contemplate that. Next time God does something you don't like. And he will. God will do something that you won't like. God will do something that might upset you, that might hurt your feelings, that might make you angry, that might cause you to say, God, I don't understand what you're doing. But understand that the God who can divide a third off of an infinite number can outsmart these doctors of the law who are going to try to entrap him. Jesus didn't just fall off the tater wagon last night. Amen? He's been around for a while. So, Moses in the law commanded us such that should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Verse 6, this they said, tempting him. Uh-oh, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That they might accuse him, but Jesus stooped down and with his finger 
wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, and we'll get to something about what he wrote here in a minute. So when they con continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now, back in my <clears throat> Bible college days, this was, this was going around. I don't know who come up with it. But I was hearing sermons from preachers saying, <clears throat> now, in the original Greek, The way the original Greek is structured, it lends the idea, which is a scholar's way of saying, I'm making this up, but go along with me anyway. It lends the idea. What, what Jesus is really saying is, he that is without this sin, let him first cast a stone. And I can remember, the first time I heard that, I'm going, wow, that is, that is amazing, wow, yeah, yeah, I bet they were all in on it, yeah. But that's not what he said. That's not what he said. He wasn't looking for someone who had committed this particular sin, he was looking for someone who was 100% righteous. And there was only one person in the whole lot of them who was 100% righteous. The one who didn't have a stone in his hand. But I, after hearing it from one guy, I heard, it, I heard it from others. It's like it went around. And this is before the internet, so I don't know how, I don't remember how stuff got around. I guess pe preachers went to meetings and they heard preachers say things and they went and preached it at their churches and other preachers heard it there and they went and preached it at their churches and so on and so on. But what he said was, he who is without sin, completely, 100% without sin, let him first cast the stone. Now, as to what he was writing, Jeremiah 17, 13. And I didn't, I didn't find this per se. One of our watchers sent me this in an email. And I thought, that's pretty good. I'll take that. Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. And that was the men. So, what was he writing? Their, na their names... Possibly, possibly. We, we still don't have 100%. And to, and to me, it's one of those things where God says, if I, didn't, if I didn't just spend a lot of time making it very clear to you, move on. Okay? Have fun with it, but move on. But I think it's, I think it's possible. I think this verse goes, I think it's mated with John 8 that their name shall be written in the earth because, see, and think of the contrast. Our name is written where? In heaven. And that, and that heaven's never going to go away. Their name is written in the earth 
and the earth is going to go away. All of the all of the atomic particles that are spinning, all of the electrons that are spinning around the neutrons and the proton, protons are going to be released in a, in a fire storm and the entire universe is going to burn up in, I, I think, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Okay? I think it's just going to be poof. Or as the Germans would say, kapoofen. <laughs> All right. So now back to John chapter 8. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So he's asking, whoever has no sin, you throw the first stone. Verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own what? Conscience. And what have I taught you your conscience is? Con means with. Science means knowledge. It means you're, you were there when you did it. Weren't you? <laughs> I'm, I'm back again watching these sovereign citizens. And they... <laughs> Some of them are dangerous. They really are. I had a guy following me for a few years back in the early days of this ministry, right around 2009, 2010, 2011, somewhere around in there. And uh, I found out that he was sort of a sovereign citizen, and I didn't really understand what it was all about. But he got, the police came, he lived with his mom, and the police came out. He was on pro, probation, and he wasn't supposed to have any firearms, and they had a warrant for his arrest because they knew he had firearms. And the police went out to his house, and he got into a gunfight with the police and lost. And they shot him dead. Shot him dead. Sovereign citizens set up a straw man or they believe that the government has set one up and so when the police pull a car over with your physical body in it it isn't your physical body that's driving the car it's the government straw man that's driving the car so therefore I am now exempt from all taxes all fines, all penalties, and all laws. Case dismissed. In other words, I'm not me. That's what they believe. That's what they try to do in court. And judges, it took a while for judges to get a grip on this. And when they finally did, boy, they started, because these guys... They film themselves in court thinking that they're going to get away with it because they were told by some idiot on YouTube that they could get away with it. And they sent $500 to some guy to get their whole package on what to say and how to say it and how to, how to release yourself from, gov from the government and all this stuff. And how to, how to remove yourself from your straw man is how you do it. Uh... I'm sorry to say, but Kent Hovind is a sovereign citizen. But anyway, um, they remove themselves from that and, and say, that's not me, but I am here to represent the person that you're speaking of. And finally, the judge says, well, if John Smith is not here in the courtroom, 
then I will issue a warrant for John Smith's arrest. And they locked the guy up. Let him sit in jail for a while and think about what he did. It's anyway. Here's your conscience. What your conscience is, it means I was there when I did it. It's how, it's how Matthew can tell whether cheeseburger's lying. Can you tell, Matthew, whether or not Lawson's lying? Okay. We could, too, with you. Yep. Because your brain knows you did it. And you have to invent... You have to write an entire Shakespearean play out of what, what you were doing when this thing took place. And remember all the details of it so that you can lie and get away with it. And it's just too hard to do. Your, your face is going to give it away all the time. So here's what the Bible says about the conscience. They were convicted by their own conscience. Romans 2, verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, Joe, you know, Gentiles were getting married before they, they knew anything about Moses? Do you know before civilizations all over the world knew anything about Moses, they had laws against stealing, laws against murder, laws against lying, Laws against not obeying religious practices, religious rituals. They had laws on all of these things. They had the law written in their heart. They knew it. So that's what he's saying here. When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Their conscience bears witness, doesn't it? And their thoughts accuses or excuses either themselves or somebody else. Okay? And it could be your conscience or your buddy's conscience. No, no, he, Mrs. Hoggard, he, he didn't do it at all. He was, he was with me riding around. I, I was with him when he didn't do it. That's your conscience. So here's what's going to happen on Judgment Day. You're going to stand before God as a lost person because your sins have not been cleared, cleansed, washed by the blood of the Lamb. You've not made repentance. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. That's never happened. So, you still have sin written in the books. When you get to heaven, and it's going to be just like a courtroom. They're going to ask you, how do you plead? Not guilty. Okay, let's bring in witnesses. First of all, let's bring in Adam. Adam, is this your son? Yes, my father, that's my son. I'm a sinner, therefore he's a sinner. Thank you, Adam, for telling the truth. Let's bring in Moses and the law. Moses, read to us the law that he violated. Moses reads the law that you violated. Then they bring conscience in. Conscience, come into the courtroom. And your conscience comes into the courtroom of God. And your conscience says, I was with him when he did let me see that list again. Yes, I remember every one, except for some of these, we were really drunk that night. 
They're a little hazy, but the rest of it, I can guarantee you we did, he did every one of those deeds. He broke your law, Heavenly Father. Your conscience is going to testify against you in God's court and you will not be able to have an excuse about it. No excuse. Because your conscience was there all the time writing down what you did. And you remember every detail. Romans 9 verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing, witness, bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Paul says, I know I'm not lying, and if you think I'm lying, watch me as I tell you. You know how some people will say, look me in the eye and tell me that you didn't do this. And some people just can't do it. They just can't do it. Because they'll look away. I didn't do it! That's what they'll do. Policemen are trained in studying psych psychological points that tell them whether or not a person might be trying to hide something or their suspect of something. Who was it used to be on Live PD? He was as good at it as anybody I've ever seen. Uh, Denver Le uh, Leverett. Den Denver Leverett, I think, was his name. He was, on, he was one of the cops on Live PD. And he would pull up to a car and he'd say, is there any, any weed, any methamphetamine, anything in this car? And all five people would say no. Ten minutes later, he's got all five people voluntarily pulling their methamphetamine and their weed out of their purse and out of their bra and out of their... All, all he, know, he knows how to ask the right questions. Okay? And I, I'd watch him and I'm going, uh-oh, these people are in big trouble. Romans 13, verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. This is, this is for those who are in law enforcement. He is the minister of God to thee for good. By the way, we had to retire our Blue Lives Matter flag. There was no blue left on it. The wind. We're going to get another one. Huh? Yeah. So anyway... Um, boy, talk, talking about the Holy Ghost, letting, letting you know on something, Steve and Jenny was supposed to leave Friday to go back to Buffalo. And they heard about, I didn't hear nothing about it, because I just don't watch the news. They heard about storms moving through there and wind. Had they left Friday... They might have been killed. They waited a day. And during... Was it, was, it, was it that? No, it was Saturday. They left Saturday morning. Yeah, they, yeah, they left Sunday morning. It, yeah, it was Sunday morning because I took, I took him out to my mom's house. But anyway, had, they, had the Holy Ghost not told them, stay, stay another day... Because they said that the winds up where they were were between 45 and 95 miles an hour. That's major stuff. But anyway, uh, back to Romans 13. For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. 
Wherefore ye must need to be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. You know what God said in the Old Testament up to Israel as a nation about them not confessing their sins as a nation to God? That they will, they will flee when no one pursues them. Now always makes me think of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's um, the, the, the Beating Heart. What was that story? It was Edgar Allan Poe, and he had killed a man in his house, and a constable came by to talk to him, and he kept, started hearing this heartbeat, and he thought, oh no, surely the constable is going to hear this, the guy's still alive, I didn't kill him, he's going to hear the heartbeat, and what it was, he was hearing his own heartbeat in his ear. You didn't read that? The Telltale Heart, that's what it was. Short story, The Telltale Heart, read that. That's your, con that's your conscience. And by the time that constable is ready to walk out, he says, I did it, I killed him! <laughs> for this, uh, anyway, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. You'll be on the run the rest of your life. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. But renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. You know what that means to a preacher? A preacher who will not preach on certain things. It is highly likely... It is because he is guilty of those things and cannot preach against them. His conscience will not allow him to. Handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Your conscience will cause you to wreck the ship. And then it will be manifested to everybody what you did. Your conscience is going to tell on you one way or the other. 1 Corinthians, I've got a verse here in here somewhere I want to get to before I quit. If any of them that believe not bid ye to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before ye eat, asking no question for conscience sake. And this deals with meat offered to idols. And what he's saying is, if you don't know where it came from, don't ask. Because if you find out that it was meat sacrificed to idols, then you shouldn't eat it. And if you go ahead and eat it, it's going to bug your conscience. And the people who are there entertaining you are going to know something ain't right and they're going to be offended anyway. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. As twice he said this now in relation to the conscience. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now, here it is. 1 Timothy 4.2. Speak, let's, let's get the gist of this. First, everybody turn to 1 Timothy. Forest Timothy.
1 Timothy chapter 4, Now the Spirit speaketh express, expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their, their conscience seared with a hot iron. Look what I have written up on the screen next to that. Daniel 2. I believe that when that kingdom establishes itself on this earth, that it will change everybody's thoughts and their awareness, and they will be seared with a hot iron, that's the iron kingdom, seared with a hot iron, and they will commit things that they know are wrong, but will delight in them because now, all of a sudden, they're no longer wrong. Look at the freedom we have now. Look at what we can do now. Do you believe that there is a strong and silent push to legalize perversions between adults and children. Very strong. Very, very strong. To legalize perversions between adults and children. And that's, that's what this opening up of what marriage is now. And then they're going to change what consent is. They're going to start following the rules, let's say, in London, where it's 16. Amsterdam, where it's 14. And it's going to go down from there. Islam, some Islamic nations can marry girls because, is, because uh, Muhammad did marry five-year-old girls. That is disgusting. That's evil. That's wicked. But that's what's coming. Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Okay? So treat your conscience well. Your conscience is your best friend. Because your conscience will spill the beans to God on the things you want to hold back. No. Let God tell, tell God all about it. He already knows anyway. Tell Him all about it. Confession is good for the soul. Confess thy sins. If we confess our sins, he, he is able and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the Bible says. Confess those sins. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are covered, whose sins are hidden, the Bible says. Mm -mm -mm. That's how you want it. You don't want to hide anything from God. You don't want to hold anything back from God. You just want God, God, just take it all. Take, take all my sins away from me. Get them away from me as far as you can. And help me, God, in this life to begin walking away from sin and, and sinners and sinful activities. That's what you need. Amen.